over 500 PNG citizens in China. New Zealand to airlift PNG students tomorrow. And PNG ports locking down entry points. This is National MTV News with Meriba Tulo. A very good evening. Thank you for joining us. This is National MTV News. The Department of Foreign Affairs says there are more than 500 Papua New Guineans currently in China. Most of the 500 are students at various universities across the country. Chinese ambassador to PNG, Zhu Bing, said they are assisting the students but are not aware of the exact number of Papua New Guineans there and their status. Meanwhile, Minister for Health, Jelta Wong, who heads the Ministerial Committee on the Coronavirus, has asked Papua New Guineans in China to remain indoors. With the utmost effort to mitigate animosity and anxiety for the 500-plus Papua New Guineans on ground in mainland China, the Chinese government is in close contact and dialogue with the PNG embassy to make sure that all Papua New Guinean students attending universities are attended to and catered for at their earliest. China also attached great importance to the safety of all foreigners in China, including PNG nationals. You know, I know recently uh, many students express their concern, uh, their fear inside China. There are still 20, 22 students in Wuhan and uh, many others in, in other parts. Um, for this, I've been communicating uh, with the Department of Health, with the Department of Foreign Affairs. I have a constant uh, communication with the officials from these de departments regarding PNG nationals. PNG ambassador to PNG Xu Bing says China has taken the most strict and comprehensive control measures that are far exceeding the World Health Organization's recommendations to keep the virus contained, further urging all PNG nationals currently in China to remain calm and to stay put as attempting to leave the republic could put them at high risk of coming in contact with the virus. Many measures have been taken with regard to the students to the foreign students in Wuhan. For example, we, we keep the students informed as how to guard against the virus and to follow closely uh, the physical condition of each student, which is uh, still inside the campus. And um, we clean up the environment of the dormitory area every day. And we provide masks, uh, sanitary liquids, and other uh, necessary materials uh, to the students. Similar messages have been directed to Chinese business owners in PNG who are in China and trying to make their way back into PNG to remain in China and await further advisories. Even though we strongly recommend students not to travel, um, it's safer to stay inside. Uh, once you are detected or you are suspected of you know, being infected, you know, the hospitals, you know, medical staff are ready to treat you. PNG's Health Minister Jelta Wong spoke to MTV, reiterating similar sentiments. We don't encourage uh, Papua New Guinea citizens or students to travel on their own. Where they are in China, within the universities, they're safe. They're safe. They have the food, they have uh, people checking the, on them every day adding that the government is closely monitoring the situation and with the advice from the Chinese authorities, PNG citizens, the students included, are incapable, hence as long as they remain calm and stay in one place in China. Once you step out of that, then you, you put yourself at risk because there's no, there's, no, um, there's no guarantee that the Chinese government will look after you because transport is down, there's no vehicles. There. How they got to the airport? How they got to Hong Kong, uh, it's, we don't know. But the thing is, we, we have assurance from Chinese government that they will look after our citizens. Anit Kora, National MTV News. 19 PNG students in Wuhan City, China, are expected to land in New Zealand tomorrow afternoon and will be quarantined for 14 days before returning home to PNG. This evacuation organized under PNG, Australia and New Zealand Foreign Affairs. The news comes as 12 other PNG students who were left stranded at Shanghai International Terminal 
Reports from our foreign affairs say the 12 are now heading to Hong Kong. Meanwhile, efforts to prevent the coronavirus reaching PNG will cost the government 10 million kina. The plea to be evacuated finally coming true. The New Zealand government taking on board PNG and Pacific students. Kristen Takup, who has been in contact with us since the outbreak, speaking last night as preparations was underway to have them evacuated. On Air New Zealand, we just got confirmation from the embassy that the Air New Zealand will airlift the students by tomorrow. Tomorrow at around um, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So this is already confirmed and all the students uh, from Huan uh, University and we are all preparing for the departure. National Department of Health Minister Delta Wong appointed to take the lead in the government's action against the coronavirus, says the secretary has briefed him that the students will be quarantined in New Zealand before the government transports them to Port Moresby. The New Zealand government who came aboard to help us uh, to, um, evacuate 21 students to, to New Zealand. Um, they, it, it was a blessing for, for us. Uh, they were the lucky ones that, that could go to, to another country and they will go to New Zealand and they will uh, incubate there for 14 days of plus and then we'll, we'll get them home. But uh, the Foreign Affairs Secretary and uh, with the help of DHS Secretary, um, they've combined well to get our students out of there. The students are expected to arrive in New Zealand tomorrow night where they will be transported to a defence facility to be quarantined. After the 14 days incubation period in New Zealand, We'll bring them home. As for the 12 stranded students in Shanghai, the minister has received news that they have travelled to Hong Kong. And ahead and went to Shanghai, but we're checking on them. If they did end up in Hong Kong, we are talking with uh, foreign affairs to see if we can keep them there for 14 days before they come back into the country. The reason we want them there is because we don't have the capacity to, if they come in and uh, we, they come straight in and go back into the village life or go back into the homes. How, how can we uh, know that they're not sick or because they, they come straight from China? So it's just a safe bet for us to keep them in, in Hong Kong for 14 days. When the Minister for Health was questioned on how other students from China were arriving without quarantine, he has advised the students to get in touch with the health authorities immediately. Students that have come in and they have not informed the authorities, they should bring it upon themselves to come into the hospitals and do a check. They should come and, this is not, like I said, this is not about just government and then doing checks. People should use their own initiative and come in and, and say that, oh, I was in Wuhan. I need to be checked or can, can you just, uh, can I be observed or give this my number. If I have a cough or if I have a fever, please come and pick me up here. And everybody needs to be on this. You can't, you can't just say the government is the only one that's going to do it. This is where I think the communication has been wrong. And, and people have been coming up with their own um, diagnose, their own um, ways to, to cure, and they've been criticizing. You know, it's time to be proactive. We need to let our people know that hygiene is the key. If they feel that somebody has as was in Wuhan and that, report them straight away. It's for their own good. Minister for Health stating he will not be jeopardizing the 11 million people of Papua New Guinea to the virus and asked all Chinese PNG students to contact the embassy before traveling or just remain in China. For them to, to get in touch with us, I mean, it's irresponsible for them to, to try and get into the country. And how do we know that they are not sick and how... You know, I have 11 million people in this country that we have to look after, and I would choose 11 million people over six people. And I would make sure that they wouldn't come into this country. Adelaide Sirox Kari, National MTV News. The New Zealand plane on a rescue mission will touch down in Wuhan overnight after the deadliest day of the coronavirus outbreak. The death toll now 426, with hundreds more in critical condition. Confirmed cases have jumped dramatically to nearly 20,500. That's more than 3,000 new cases just in the past day. 
And now concerns from the Chinese community have forced the cancellation of Auckland's Lantern Festival, the biggest cultural event in New Zealand. Rescue flight days in the planning. Air New Zealand's confident its mission to Wuhan's on track, one of three airlines extracting stranded passengers tonight. We'll get in and get out as quickly as possible and that's the one learning that we have uh, from the other airlines is, uh, is try to be in front of the queue. The airlines taken advice from other carriers working closely with health officials too. Passenger check-in time is actually seven hours for this flight, so quite an extensive um, check-in time. Among the passengers, this Aussie grateful for for the ride out. A second plane is coming. I got an email tonight saying that the timing is to be finalised, but they're taking all of our information. Those working on board will have exclusive use of the business class cabin. They'll wear protective gear, and the pilots are now familiar with the new terrain. The crew have actually gone into the simulator and uh, flown the approaches, mainly so when they arrive there, they know what they're going to receive, and land at the airport in the simulator. The flight departs Hong Kong at midnight and lands at Wuhan at 2 a.m. It'll take two hours to load the passengers taking off at four. And 13 hours later, the flight's expected in Auckland just after five. Once they reach New Zealand, um, they will be transported um, to a, a Defence Force facility that has facilities for them that will keep them comfortable for a couple of weeks. We'll have medical professionals on site. They will be able to be um, amongst their groups, but also in a bit of isolation from one another. And they'll be under medical care. We can also reassure the local community that there is no risk to them of the fact that these people will be in Whangapuroa military camp. There will be security measures in place. Air New Zealand says the crew and doctors on board will keep an eye out for any travellers becoming unwell and if necessary the crew will seek advice from a dedicated monitoring team. The Group Emergency Control Centre for Air New Zealand has been stepped up and will be maintaining operational oversight uh, of the flight in real time. So much planning for this unusual journey about to take flight. Social media videos out of China reveal the harsh actions being taken to contain the spread of coronavirus. Global concerns are growing, but Chinese authorities are struggling with the scale of the outbreak. In China's state media, the focus is now on uniting the country to fight the virus. Hundreds of military doctors and nurses have been arriving in Wuhan to join the battle. When our country is in difficulty, it is our duty to be on the front line. But there is an ugly side to this all-out fight against the virus. In this unverified footage, the man pinned on the ground was caught without a face mask. Spray him with disinfectant, the official shouts. In much of China, wearing a mask is now compulsory, despite doubts about their effectiveness. In this video, a whole family is being forcibly removed from their home to a waiting ambulance. Lots of videos like these are being shared to foreign websites. They show police locking an old man suspected of having the virus in his home. Do you have enough rice, the policeman says. OK, we're chaining the door. Scenes like those now can be found right across social media, and they're really fueling the sense of anxiety and fear about the coronavirus that is spreading right around the world, but nowhere more so than here in Hong Kong. People here simply do not believe they're getting a realistic picture of what is happening in Wuhan and central China. And that's why there is now a crescendo of demand that Hong Kong close its border with the mainland completely. Hong Kong's chief executive ordered more border crossings closed, but said some must remain open. That was not good enough for these hospital workers who have now voted to strike until the border is shut. Fear is even more contagious than the virus. This is the center of Shanghai, China's biggest city and economic heart. When the bill comes in for all of this, it is going to be huge. Back home now in PNG Ports Corporation will be assisted by the National Health Department, PNG Customs, Nakia and all shipping lines to monitor and restrict the movement of vessels into the country. This is a preventative measure against the 2019 novel coronavirus that has been declared as a global emergency by the World Health Organization. All international shipping vessels, both cargo containers and passenger carriers, will only be allowed into PNG through the Motocare port in Port Mosby, the Lay Wharf in Morbe and Simpson Harbour in Rabaul, East New Britain. 
the strict restrictions on the movement of all international shipping vessels come in six directives that by now should be implemented at the three designated ports in the country. They include the screening of all passengers on board and the clearance of the shipping vessels upon their arrival at the three ports. While the World Health Organization is in close discussions with national authorities on how to conduct proper screening at these ports, it is understood no Tamil scanners have been put in place at these ports yet. When a vessel comes first into port, it has to fly the yellow flag. The yellow flag, it shows them that uh, they need to be checked by a medical health officer, which is the, we call them the health and quarantine boarding officers. And what they do is they go on board, they check the medical list, and uh, if there's, um, if the captain uh, says that, oh, we have one sick, then they quarantine that person within, on the ship itself. For Papua New Guinea, the movement of goods through international shipping vessels are vital for the country's economy. But with over 20,000 coronavirus cases reported globally, the PNG government is doing all it can to prevent the virus from bridging our borders. If we keep delaying things and making, uh, not allowing the ships, the price rises and our people suffer. So it's a balance. Of, um, we, we make sure that the preventive measures are strict and vigilant and we have a good reporting system and that's why we, we allow the ships to come in. But at the, at the moment our immigration minister is uh, looking at uh, three ports uh, to beef up the security, to get more um, health quarantine officers there so that they can board ships and, uh, and, and bring them in. Last week, opposition leader Belden Nama raised concerns about login vessels that come into Papua New Guinea. Meanwhile, land borders at Wutung in West Sipik and Wham in Western Province have been closed off following a directive from the Immigration Department. I think uh, what we need to do as a country is to see, how we, uh, see our capacity to be able to uh, address this and enforce uh, minister's directive. Uh, in Vanimo especially, there are not enough uh, officers there. And uh, not only the, about the manpower shortage, but we do not have the uh, necessary uh, equipments and the uh, facilities to carry out these uh, checks, the tests, on the, the possible uh, carriers of the uh, coronavirus. So I think uh, we're still vulnerable. If, um, if there's anything, uh, we are very vulnerable uh, of a coronavirus uh, attack in our country. And my, also, uh, my serious concern is also, also on the, uh, the uh, logging ship that's coming into the country. MTV News has confirmed with PNGDF personnel who are on board the operations at both the southern and northern PNG Indonesian borders that there are no movements of traditional border crosses between the two border provinces. Thekla Gunga, National MTV News. Communication Minister Timothy Masiose's strategies will be in place to allow citizens to get up-to-date information on what the government is doing to protect our borders from the coronavirus. Information from Ministerial Heads of Health, Immigration, Foreign Affairs, Civil Aviation and Communication will be released to the media and through information pamphlets. In conjunction with the Health Department, we'll be coming up with some pamphlets and some brochures all these things we will develop, we will print them and we will put them up for the public to read. And I am calling on all media outlets, especially Post Korea, National Newspaper, to help us in accepting this, to put in the newspapers, the daily newspapers, so that the general population can pick up this information from right throughout the country. We are also going to do some short radio, um, radio jingles and radio promotions. Uh, for provincial radio stations to play in the provinces 
Um, I know that uh, we may be only concentrating, you may be thinking that we are concentrating in Port Mosby only. No, we are concentrating on the rest uh, throughout the country. We are, we are looking at the whole country. We want the whole country to know that we are, we, we are making things, uh, decisions and making things happen. So I'm, I'm happy. This is National MTV News among stories after the break. Six newly appointed judges sworn in and opposition leader calls on the government to pay retired servicemen their entitlements. Stay tuned for the details. Welcome back to National MTV News. Six newly appointed judges of the National and Supreme Courts today swore an oath to uphold the law of the country and serve its people. Chief Justice Gib Salika said the judges were practicing lawyers and magistrates who were appointed on merit. They were sworn in by Acting Governor General Job Pomat. The newly appointed judges include Dr. Virgil Narakobi, Sinclair Peniel Gora and John Kamane Nomambo, who will be serving a 10-year period at the National and Supreme Courts. Jeffrey Leonard Shepard will be serving a 3-year period, while Paulus Doa will be serving as acting judge for a 12-month period. Elizabeth Nala Suelip was the only woman judge sworn in today. She will be serving as acting judge at the Supreme and National Courts for a 12-month period. According to Chief Justice Segib Salika, they are planning to appoint more women judges in the future. Uh, there are, as I said, there are some, you know, good young, um, uh, rising, uh, rising women lawyers who, who are doing very well, and we've keep given them the messages. Yeah, you're doing fine. Keep, keep on doing it, and uh, we'll, we'll, a time will, your time will come when, when it comes. The newly appointed judges now bring the total number of judges in the country to 42, including the Chief Justice and Deputy Chief Justice. According to the Chief Justice, they were appointed by merit under the organic law and it is part of their career development. But there are also plans to appoint more judges. So far we have 43, 43 judges um, as of today's swearing in. As of today's swearing, we have now have 43. Um, 41 uh, substantive and uh, three acting. So this year I'm hoping to work with 46, hopefully, 46 or 47, uh, that is 42 substantive judges and five or six acting judges. The Chief Justice in congratulating the judges also pointed out that there are over 8,000 registered cases still pending in the National and Supreme Courts. He challenged the judges to work hard this year to address these cases. I will be asking the judges to dig deep, to, you know, to put in a lot more hours than what they were doing before so that we can attend to the needs of our people. Rayon Lakingu National, MTV News. Chief Justice Sir Gibbs Salika has expressed concern over the construction of the Waigani Courthouse that has been left incomplete. He said the whole project cost over 600 million kina. However, they have not been receiving enough funding from the government to complete the courthouse. The Chief Justice added that they were allocated only over 70,000 kina under this year's budget and that is not enough to complete this project. He has also called on the government to help fund the construction of the courthouse. Oh, I wanted 250 million kina to complete the building this year. If they gave me that amount this year, the building would be by December of this year, by July, August, it would have been completed. But they gave me only 70 million kina for 2020, and that's not going to, um, to that's not going to complete the job. Uh, so uh, that's my disappointment. Um, yeah, thank you for raising it. It's um, it's another 250 million kina to go before it's completed. I asked for it. I didn't get that money. Oh, it's over 600, over 600 million. To other news now, and a partnership that has been sealed now enables contributors of major superannuation fund, NAS Fund, to receive discounts from major retailer Brian Bell. This partnership, one that has been in place for just over a decade. Through this agreement, contributors can take advantage of a standard 15% discount with 30% discounts at selected times throughout this year. 
the heads of superannuation provider NAS Fund and leading retailer Brian Bell today signed an agreement that enables NAS Fund contributors to take advantage of discounts at Brian Bell outlets. This partnership, one that has been in place since 2011. Um, uh, both the Brian Bell group of companies and uh, NAS Fund and ha have had a very long-standing partnership for over nine years now. So 2011, I think, was the first uh, uh, venture that we uh, entered into together. And I'm very uh, proud as a CEO to, um, to ensure that we continue that uh, long-standing partnership here today. Normally we would uh, annualise that and re-sign, but uh, in more recent times, in conversation with Ian and myself, we thought it was... Uh, 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 time that we uh, extended that uh, offer to a three-year arrangement and uh, look to uh, long-term uh, future opportunities together and, um, and enjoy the benefits that that uh, discount uh, brings. According to NASFAN CEO Ian Tarotia, this decision to continue their partnership with Brian Bell is part of efforts to maximise benefits to its members. In terms of numbers uh, that have been provided to us, the savings to our general membership in terms of the transactions that are made, it's about half a million kina uh, per annum, I think. And if you look at, uh, if you look across the, the volumes of the membership that we have, that's half a million members that we have, that is real value back to our members. And that's the kind of partnership that we enjoy with uh, Brian Bell as a significant member of our membership discount program. Through this partnership, NAS Fund members can claim a minimum of 15% discount on goods purchased from Brian Bell, with double discounts available at certain times throughout the year. Um, for all of the uh, the members of um, uh, the NAS Fund um, uh, uh, business, uh, we provide an opportunity for them to receive a discount, uh, and that has been a, a long-standing part of this uh, partnership for a, for a period of time now. Norm this deal is being seen as a win-win for both parties, as NAS Fund continues to push its mission of adding more value to its members. This one more significant, as the superannuation fund has a direct equity in the Brian Bell Group. NAS Fund members have a stake in Brian Bell. So we have, uh, on behalf of, of our membership, 20% um, in the Brian Bell company as equity. And we're the only institutional investor alongside the uh, family members of Brian Bell. So in terms of value, that's about 80 million kina of investment that NAS Fund members have in Brian Bell. Also importantly, the staff of Brian Bell uh, stakeholders of the company, so that's an important link. Given the current economic situation, many businesses have been forced to scale back operations and in some instances lay off staff. However, for one major retailer, the current market climate has allowed it to begin work on improving its facilities and streamline operations to set it up for better times ahead. Speaking to MTV News, Brian Bell CEO Cameron McKellar says the Brian Bell Group has already commenced work on several facilities in Port Mosby as well as plans for some centres around the country over the next few months. All these developments aimed at providing a more conducive environment for its customers as well as to improve its operations. We built a uh, 16,000 square metre warehouse out at Gerahu and as a result of that we had a uh, warehouse next door to this facility uh, that was underutilised. So we're now in the process of converting that uh, to a brand new 21 uh, retail shopping centre which will be interconnected with the home centre here. So uh, that will, uh, as you can see, uh, we're under development at the moment and that will complete in, uh, in April uh, this year. So there will be a significant um, uh, retail precinct in addition to our home centre uh, that's, uh, that's built here. On Despite the tough times at the end of the day, um, everyone says that it's a difficult economy and uh, the reality is that uh, that's true, but uh, we make these commitments you know, uh, well in advance of uh, you know, where 2020 was going to uh, end up. But uh, our commitment is to continue to build and grow uh, Brian Bell in this uh, wonderful country and uh, we're very well supported by all the consumers in the market and uh, if we don't then uh, you know that consumer sentiment you know may wane over time. You're watching Tuesday's news. The Eastern Britain Provincial Government plans to relocate the people of Duke of York due to climate change. We'll have that story and more when we return. Welcome back to National MTV News. 
The East New Britain provincial government has pledged to relocate the people on Duke of York Island following signs of land shortage prompted by climate change impacts and a population boom. East New Britain Governor Naki Kuskonga says the Duke of York people who are affected may face a possible relocation to Putput along the south coast area in the Pomio district. Konga says an abandoned coconut plantation has been bought off by the provincial government and will be dedicated to the relocated islanders. The move taken by the East New Britain provincial government comes amid growing concerns which stemmed from the impacts of climate change. The Duke of York Islanders know all too well that the battle against the rising sea level is one that they will eventually lose. Not only that, but the population of the island keeps growing and land has become scarce and the islanders are worrying about their future. During a recent visit to the island, the East New Britain governor, Naki Kuskonga, told the people who gathered that East provincial government may have an answer to their plight. Population is going to be in the ground. So we can be able to acquire a football plantation. It's going to be given to the provincial government of East New Britain. So we can be able to divide properly the plantation. Am I clear? Yes. And I will make sure that two of you, you probably have some 5,000 hectares. Yeah. Census estimates have put the total population of Duke of York Island at around 10,000 men, women and children. And it is an island that is facing a serious problem. Along most of its coastlines, the sea has taken over what used to be the shoreline. The water holes that they use are now submerged. And these impacts, when coupled with the ever-increasing population, has made the problem more severe. Now long population, 2012, going up long 2017, population in Opilapilai, in Opilapilai, 13,000. The new relocation site will be at Putput, along the south coast of Pomio district. Governor Conga says he wants the people to settle and engage in cash crop farming to sustain their livelihoods in a long run. So you know, people are sitting on the and become complacent. Yeah. But you go down there, you walk in the house, yeah. but we put them on the road. In the next few years, the first lot of islanders will be relocated. But there are still uncertainties amongst the people about who will go and who will remain on the island. Edwin Fidelis, National MTV News, Kokopo. Concerns on how families of ex-servicemen of the Papua New Guinea Defence Force are being evicted from their homes has been raised by the opposition. Opposition leader Belda Nama, a former PNGDF officer, has urged the government to properly farewell the ex-servicemen and fast-track their entitlements. Last week, verbal directions were given to at least seven families of retired soldiers to vacate the houses they were occupying at Murray Barracks. It has been six days since directives were given to families of retrenched PNGDF soldiers to vacate the houses they were occupying at Mari Barracks. While the affected families described the eviction as forceful, the directive was from the PNGDF Iraqi. Those affected include retrenched soldiers who joined and served the Defense Force between 1970s to the year 2000. These interviews were conducted last week after they were asked to pack up and leave. So me still waiting entitlement blonen na me like him container na yeah liquid money and balus ticket money blow me to na me plago. So man plago in 2001 he finish or give me 500 kina. That is inhuman. This is against human rights. What have they done to our old ones? Most of these fathers have saved that back or even brought this country to where it is now. The independent state of Papua New Guinea. Through the colo colonial era a days to now. So we kindly ask if the Prime Minister can call in to stop this um, eviction exercise that is going on. In 2010, a team of defense officers were tasked to review the Defense Force Retirement Benefits Fund Act to maximize benefits for its members. In 2012, the only-led government allocated 100 million kina to 
to settle entitlements for the ex-servicemen. However, to date, there are no proper records of how much money was paid out to the retrenched offices, if any payments were made at all. I call on the Defence Force Secretary and Defence Force Commander to stop and account for all the servicemen, go through whatever entitlements that they have under the uh, Manual of Personal Administration within the Defence Force, give them a golden handshake and send them home properly. This treatment is inhumane, it's uncalled for, and should stop immediately. Meanwhile, for the families affected, some have vacated the houses, while others are yet to move out. Thakla Gunga, National MTV News. Moraba province has passed a budget of almost 500 million kina, a budget leaning more towards rural development. This year, wards and local level governments have been included under major development interventions and service delivery projects within the province. From the budget, almost 3 million kina has been allocated for wards and almost 5 million kina for local level governments. The Morabe provincial budget of over 500 million kina includes national grants of over 300 million kina and internal revenue of almost 200 million kina. The national grants covers 12 components, including teachers' salaries, which get a bulk of national grants with over 100 million kina. Morabe's internal revenue was mostly generated from goods and services tax alone, clearly indicating a need for for the province to generate more income. The provincial budget also includes 36 major service delivery projects, one of which is the Mama Medivac program by Manolos Aviation Company. Mama Medivac program, one million is not enough. Now you can see that they now do or one million is not enough. We don't say you can get to but this is a service that you can get a passport. We support the Missoula, but Mama died, the helicopter carry more. This is a very important program. It could have been more. Suppose we try to stick some of what have you saw. You make a support for this one, and people like it, you can take more of this one. Suppose you like it, people are coming, people are coming. Under the projects also, and for the first time, is Ward Development Grants Program. All 565 wards in Morbe will each be getting a 5,000 kina slice from the 200 million 825,000 kina allocated through this grant. But they will not do the old market place for you to remember the president there. They will want to control the market for the place. Now this is not money we market them control there. The 2020 Morbe Provincial Budget sees decentralization of functions in the districts and local level governments. Shalin Eri, National MTV News, Lay. You're watching National MTV News. We go for another break. When we come back, some sporting updates in Trukai Sports. Sports. Welcome to Trukai Sports. We begin with Rugby League and Petro Sivanasiva made his way up to Papua New Guinea over the weekend. He was here in partnership with Bank South Pacific and the Brisbane Broncos. Sivanasiva talked a bit on his latest project, a rugby league team from Fiji that will be taking part in Australia. Petero Sivinasiva, former rugby league player for the Brisbane Broncos and the Penrith Panthers, is now the chairman of new Fiji rugby league team, the Kaiviti Silk Tails. So uh, fortunately for us, uh, we've been um, uh, being able to successful in our bid to, to uh, go to the New South Wales uh, uh, Rugby League. Uh, the competition that we've chosen is the Ron Massey Cup, which is third tier, um, with our uh, endeavours to hopefully work our way into the Intrust Cup level. Kaiviti means man from Fiji, while silk tails is a bird found in Fiji. Sevenasiva says it was quite a long planning process, 
but a lot of inspiration was drawn from the SPP and Hunter's success in the Queensland Interest Super Cup. It's been a project that I've been working on now for uh, just the best part of six years, so um, obviously taking a lot of inspiration from uh, the PNG Hunters and to see the way that they've uh, uh, come into the, the Queensland Interest uh, Super Cup uh, and obviously winning the title. Pictures are on Facebook and the internet on the preparations of the Kaiviti Silk Tails. The team is in the Ron Messi Cup, a step below the New South Wales Cup, the Interest Premiership. Sivina Siva says from there, the team would like to make its way up to the Tier 2 competition. I just thought that um, uh, obviously with uh, local Fiji Rugby League, um, we're just probably not at that level as the Hunters were to be able to go straight into Interest. It might just take us a year or two uh, in Ron Massey, then uh, hopefully transition up into uh, Interest uh, Super Cup. Yeah. The successful bid by the Silk Tails in the 2020 Ron Messi Cup is on the back of the overwhelming talent of Fijian players past and present in the National Rugby League and more success is expected in developing more of native Fiji talent. You know, Fijian players like uh, Mike Sivo and uh, we had Semi Radradra at the Parramatta Eels there uh, before he left for rugby, uh, Viliama Kikau, Suliasi Vunivalu, I mean there's, uh, there's some exceptional talent uh, of uh, Fijian heritage. Uh, so you can, uh, you can see now that the, the interest in rugby league is, uh, is getting really big, uh, obviously not at the level as uh, PNG. Uh, no one will ever be uh, as uh, loyal and uh, as supportive as uh, PNG uh, supporters, but uh, it's now starting to grow, which is great. But uh, I think now we're bringing this team in, I think you'll see the popularity of rugby league grow in Fiji. Felix Sukina, National MTV Sports. To boxing and Oceania Fight Promotions is set for another big year of professional boxing. OFP, on its mission to revive pro boxing in the country, have taken another step in signing contracts with professional boxers for the next three years. Oceania Fight Promotions hosted four international professional boxing events last year. This year, they have bigger plans of taking the sport to the next level. They will be registering pro boxers who want to participate in the company's promotions for the next three years. To all interested boxers who are willing to join us, please do come along and do come forward with your boxing profile in order to be part of our team. The main aim is to prioritize and promote local professional boxers in PNG. The contract states, pro boxers signed with Oceania Fight Promotions will not be eligible to fight in other promotions. Contract also encourages the boxers to have good managers, trainers and coaches who can be able to train and manage them will lead up to their fights. Today, the first seven boxers signed their contracts witnessed by their managers. A boxer is only allowed to sign the contract witnessed by their manager. Oceania Fight Promotions has been recognized by the World Boxing Council in association with the Asia Boxing Council organization. The kind of exciting fights that we have seen uh, in, in four events that have been organized by Oceania Fight Promotions. So it is only uh, proper that uh, the boxers enter into proper contracts, into proper agreements that will take care of uh, their training, their preparation and the promotion of their fights. Elijah Levet, National MTV Sports. Don't go anywhere, we'll have more of Trukai Sports right after these messages. Trukai Sports. Welcome back to Trukai Sports. To some sport abroad and organizers for next year's Women's Rugby World Cup say facilities will be in line with their male counterparts as they gear up for the 2021 tournament in New Zealand. When it comes to Rugby World Cup 2021, organisers are pitching a party, they're selling a legacy. Sharing and spreading the passion, power and energy of the women's game. And they're pledging some parity. All match and training facilities and accommodation will be on parity with international men's tournaments and the 2011 event. Expectations are high and if it can be like the 2011 World Cup, that would be awesome. There's no doubt the women's game is booming and the players are buying in. That was amazing, eh? Sorry, I'm already emotional. Sorry. Oh. 
we want to inspire their next generation and it was spoken up there before around you know creating heroes for these young young boys and girls to look up to. But there are challenges. Organisers also want it to feel like 2011 when communities from north to south embraced every team. The problem? Next year's matches are only being played in Auckland and Whangarei. We'd like to think that you know uh, for a lot of people the games won't be too far out of touch geographically to get to so but by and large we're going to have to promote it really well. And what about the long term plan for the women's game? Well I think you'd like to see that by the time in five, six years time when we're looking at the next World Cup that we've got more teams that, are, that we deem as competitive. For the defending champion Black Ferns that may mean more test fixtures. Unlike the All Blacks they are yet to have a schedule confirmed beyond next year. November window, July windows, I think those are the times that we should be looking to get more games, maybe the more European teams coming down here and vice versa, uh, Kiwi teams going up north. Planning for a future, the Black Ferns are hoping to grow when the rugby world's focus turns here once more. Kimberly Downs, One News. That's it for Trukai Sports. We go for a final break. When we come back, a quick look at the weather for the next 24 hours. Trukai Sports. True Kai Sports. This weather update is proudly brought to you by Money Plus. With you always. A quick look at the weather forecast for the next 24 hours in the southern region. Cloudy periods expected in Port Mosby and Alotau. Some showers in Daru, Kerma and Papandeta. To the Mamasi region, cloudy weather and some showers expected across the region in Leh, Wau, Medang, Biwak and Vanimo. To the New Guinea Islands region, fine becoming cloudy later on for Lorangau and Kaviang. Cloudy weather and some showers expected in Kokopo, Rabaul, Kimbe and Buka. And in the Highlands region, all the major centres, Mount Hagen, Goroka, Kundiawa, Mendi and Wabe can all expect cloudy weather with early morning fog developing and some showers expected in Mount Hagen. The weather update was proudly brought to you by Money Plus, with you always. And that's the way it is today, Tuesday, the 4th of February 2020. On behalf of the National MTV News team right around the country, pleasant viewing on your number one to watch. Good night. <laughs>